So the idea is actually pretty simple. I want to create a stunning, perfectly diffused LED border around both garage doors, plus I want to have the lights automatically turn on when a car comes into the driveway. And since your garage already has a natural frame around it to work with, this is a fun project that can easily be done in one afternoon. So one of the most important parts of this project is going to be choosing a diffuser channel. Muzada very recently came out with a brand new profile that I've been dying to do a project with, but I wanted to hold off until they were available in 2 meter long sections, and I'm happy to report that they're now available. These are slightly bigger than the U108 channels that I've used in many projects, but what's awesome is that the milky white cover is thinner, which means the light will be brighter while still getting that perfect neon glow that you're used to with the U108 model. Now obviously, we're going to have a few corners that we have to deal with, and since I'm going for a seamless look with no gaps or breaks in light, these will have to be cut. And for best results, I highly recommend getting a miter saw or asking around to see if you could use a friend's. So for cutting these, you pretty much have to reinforce the cut area with tape. I'll be using some painter's tape to make it more challenging for the saw to rip the plastic diffuser out of the profile while cutting. Go ahead and make the 45 degree angle cuts so that when they come together, they form a very nice looking 90 degree turn like I have here. For mounting, these come with hardware that you can use. This would get screwed into the surface and then the profile can snap in place along the small grooves cut near the bottom of the channel. However, since these are pretty light, I'll just be using some simple 3M sticky pads. I've used these on a number of projects, and as long as you don't install them in freezing cold, they stick really well. And I ended up using about 4 of these sticky pads for every 2 meter section. From here, it was as simple as going around and sticking them in place. And it was nice because I had the black wood pieces to act as a guide, so I didn't even bother using a level. I started at the top left corner area and then worked my way around. Now one of my goals with this project is to make it hardly noticeable during the day when the lights are off, and I want it to blend in as much as possible without having to go to the extreme of embedding it into the wood. Once I had the right side done, I moved on to the smaller, single car garage door. And one thing I do recommend though if you go with the 3M sticky pads is to wipe down the surface first to get rid of any dust. I'll zoom in a little bit closer on this side so you can see how nice the angles are able to come together which will make it look like this is one long, solid, continuous run of neon light. And with the last piece up, so far I'm loving how well it's blending in. Moving on to another main component which is the actual lighting. BTF became the first company to offer the incredible 12 volt SK6812 individually addressable LEDs on Amazon. These just launched and I couldn't be more excited because this is the perfect project to use them. They have a dedicated white LED to go along with all the RGB options. It has 60 LEDs per meter, which is what you need for a spotless effect. They remain individually addressable for smooth animations and they're 12 volts so you can do longer runs without needing to inject power. These also might be the most solder friendly strips available. Here I have them right above the 5V SK6812 strips and the copper pads in the 12V variants are much larger giving you more real estate for connecting your own wires for custom installs. Next I'll be going over what I'll be doing to prep the strips. I'll first take out my all-in-one soldering kit and if you're curious on what this is or how to get it I'll leave a link in the description you can check out. I'll be cutting off the first LED and then applying some solder to the three copper pads in the strip. And using this USB-C battery pack to heat the iron, it can get up to about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. But for stuff like this, I'm generally keeping it at about 600 degrees. I will mention though that the kit comes with lead-free solder, but I still prefer my leaded solder and this stuff from Kester is the best I've ever used. Next I'll be prepping my own wires to attach to the strip. This will give me the flexibility to have my controller and power further away from the start of the lights. And I recommend to use more than you think you'll need because you can always cut them shorter later. And to make this project as easy to follow, I'll keep everything as consistent as possible. Red will always be power, green will be data, and white or black will be ground or negative. Now I don't want to take up too much more time going over every detail of soldering and getting the wires attached to the strip, so I'll speed through this part. But just know that I already made a couple how-to solder videos that goes over everything I'm doing here with close-up footage and extreme detailed commentary that I'll link in the description if you're interested in learning this simple skill. Learning how to solder when it comes to LED projects gives you so much more freedom in creating anything you can think of because you no longer have to rely on finding that perfect solder free connection that may not even exist for what you need it to do. I'll be using a little bit of heat shrink tubing to reinforce the connection, plus it'll give it a little bit more protection from moisture. This will be installed under the overhang on my garage so I'm not too concerned about water, but I am excited to see how well this will hold up over time. Next, since I know one 5 meter roll isn't going to be long enough for either side, I'm going to solder another 5 meter roll to the end of the first one. I'll cut off the last LED of the first roll, and then the first LED of the second roll, and then connect them together. And of course, make sure to watch the arrows on the strip to ensure they're all going in the same direction, which will be away from whatever controller you end up using. Before installing the LED strip, you have to remove the milky white diffuser covers from the channels, and try keeping them in somewhat of an order so it's easy to remember where they go when you put them back in. 
Now if you did use the miter saw to make the cuts, you'll definitely have a lot of debris that you'll want to clean out. I first used a glove to get rid of most of the tiny particles, and then I used a leaf blower to clear out the rest. So for the standard size two car garage door, I'm going to start the LED strip on the bottom left and work my way clockwise. As I'm working my way up, you're probably all wondering what I'll be doing for the corners. There's certainly many different directions you could go, but to make my life easier, I'll be doing the controversial bend technique, and here's the reason why. Back when I built my gaming room at my old house, I did a total of 9 bends this way, and in the close to 2 years I lived there before moving, I had a total of 0 issues with those strips, so while it may not be the best, my experience proved it could be done and it could last. And if you're curious on what the bend method is for a 90 degree angle, here's what I'm talking about. I will add that I've only done this on LED strips that have 30 or 60 LEDs per meter because you actually have a little space between the lights. If you try doing this on non-cob LED strips that have 100 or 144 LEDs per meter, I can't speak for those results. But here you can see it is working perfectly fine using this technique. This made the rest of the installation go super fast and it's always one of my favorite parts putting the lights in the profile since I know it means progress is being made on the project. Once I got to the end, I cut off the extra lights, and for this side, it almost used up the entire 10 meters that I had prepared. Once that step was done, I went ahead and snapped the diffusers back in place, and I had everything laid out the way they came off, so I was able to put it all back in with it lining up perfectly. And at the end, since there's nothing that needs to be fed out the bottom, I used one of the end caps to seal it up so that no dirt, dust, or bugs would find their way in. So now that the large right side is done, I need to do pretty much the same thing with the smaller one-car garage door on the left. And really, the only thing I'm doing different is starting the LED strip on the bottom right and working my way counterclockwise. I'm doing this because it'll be much easier to connect the two sections to the controller inside my garage right in the middle with the starting points of both sides being close together compared to if I started this run on the left side and went clockwise. And the beauty of WLED is that I can use the software to reverse the direction so I'll be able to get the animations to flow in whatever direction I want regardless of my starting point which I'll show you later. And I did prepare another 10 meters of the 12 volt SK6812 lights for this side the exact same way as the other, but obviously I won't be needing as much, but it still ended up being around 7 meters. Now before moving on, I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Aura. So this is me signing up for their free 14 day trial, and during the setup process one of the many things they do is scan the internet for data brokers that have your personal information. These data brokers then make a fortune selling your information to spammers, scammers, and other entities that want to know more about you. Now Aura was able to find 30 such instances of my personal information being in the hands of these companies. Then with one click, Aura sends out a notice to have my information removed from their systems, which they are legally required to do when asked. Their all-in-one platform offers antivirus protection, credit monitoring, credit lock, financial transaction alerts, secure VPN, identity protection, parental controls, 24-7 US-based customer service, and much, much more. I'll leave a link in the description for you to start your own free 14-day trial, so please make sure to check them out. Thank you all so much, and now back to the video. Next, we have to choose a controller, and for this part of the video, I created a mock-up of what I now have in my garage to make it easier to follow along. We'll pretend that this is the LED strip on the left side of the garage, and that this is on the right. Now I realize for many people you'll just have the one garage door, and if that's the case you can make this about as minimal as possible and use the Mag WLED controller. Just make sure to have the switch right here flipped to the 12 volt side. I'll remove the JST connector that it comes with, I'll strip back the wires that I have soldered onto my LED strip, and then get them connected to the board. And the beauty of these 12 volt SK6812 lights is that you can easily power the close to 10 meters of lights that I have on my double garage door with a simple USB-C power adapter that puts out 12 volts and 3 amps. And it's crazy to think we've come this far that right here is all you'd need for a project of this size. Now if you are like me and will have multiple strips, or even if you just have the one, the other option that I highly recommend using would be Gladopto's brand new 4 channel output WLED controller. This company has definitely gone all in with their pursuit of being the best in the business and they keep coming out with amazing new devices. So with this kit they include a couple Wago style connectors that I'll use to split the data and ground 4 ways to match the 4 separate data outputs that we have. They include a small, what looks like 16 gauge red wire to connect the voltage to the splitter like I'm doing here. Then for the ground I used an equal size black wire to split that four ways as well. How this plays out then with our two LED strips would be the red voltage lines coming from our lights will go into two of the four voltage openings. Our two grounds will go into two of the four ground slots. 
and then one of our datas would go into one of the four separate blue terminals, and the other data would go into another one of the four blue data outputs. This will still leave you with two more data terminals that you could always add more lights to down the road. Here's a close-up of how it looks with the first data output being GPIO 16, the second one is 4, and the remaining two available slots are 2 and 1. For the power supply, I have a 12 volt 10 amp unit that will be connecting to the bare terminals on the input side of the controller. This will be more than enough to power all the lights I have installed on the garages, with plenty left over in case I want to expand down the road. This also takes the barrel plug so you can for sure use the more traditional type supplies as well. And since this part of the project will be inside my garage, and my garage is a mess, I'm not too worried about cable management. But you definitely could get a nice little box like this to neatly tuck everything away to give it a less cluttered type look. Let's head back out to the garage, and as far as bringing the wires inside, I'll be using some good old fashioned duct tape. This will be able to blend in nicely with the black trim work, so again, unless you're really looking hard, you're not going to notice this. I would also recommend using tape to try covering up around the cables coming out of the diffuser to help keep dirt and bugs out. And I'll probably run the loose wires through some cable tracks at some point, but here I have both sides connected to our controller and power in the middle, and since both the Gladopto and May controllers have data boosters, it's not necessary to keep the wires super short, which gives you lots of flexibility on where to set this up. So ultimately, I'm going to want the animations to start here on the left and travel left to right while seamlessly making the jump from our first section to our larger section right here and then continuing up and around. Then when at the end, the effects will jump all the way back to the beginning and start over. And in order to do this in WLED under LED preferences, here's how I have it set up. The left garage door is set up on the GPIO 4 slot, so that's going to be set up first. I have the LED type set to SK6812, color order is GRB, swap set to none, and this section has 429 LEDs. Now since my starting point is actually right here and I want it to begin over here, all I have to do is check the reverse rotate 180 degree box to get it to switch. The right garage section, which is connected to the GPIO 16 slot in the controller, will be set up the same way as above, but the length on this run is 559, and I don't need to rotate this one 180 degrees. And I do have the brightness limiter turned on and set to 7000 milliamps. Now if what I just covered went completely over your head, I made full setup tutorials for both the Meg WLED controller and Gladopto's controller that I'll link in the description if interested. Those videos go over every detail of getting you up and running, including getting them connected to your home network, downloading the free app, as well as going over all the settings you need to configure with these plug and play WLED devices. So if you don't care about the motion activating aspect of this project, the good news is you're officially done. But before going over all the final results, if you are curious on one of the many different ways to make this a smart setup, responding to motion, or other sensor type products, here's what I did to make that happen. Now a while back I did a couple projects at my old house. One for my stairs that has over 3 million views, and another for my closet that has 250,000. And in both of those builds I used a car smart home products, and from the time we set them up until the time we moved, I had zero issues with any of them. So for this, you'll first need to pick up one of their smart hubs. You have a couple different options, but I went with their new one, the M3. Next, you'll need to get whatever sensor you want to go with. For this build, I'll be using their motion sensor, but there's many different ones you could go with. And finally, you'll need an Alexa device, and I went with their new Echo Dot. First, let's go ahead and set up the Acara Hub. Download and install their app, and then add accessory. It automatically found the M3, so you can go ahead and click on it. Next, scan the QR code on the hub, and it will ask you if you want to set up a wired or wireless connection. I'll go with wireless. I'll then connect it to my home network and click Next Step. You can give it a name and assign it to a room, and you're all set. To set up the motion sensor, first pull the plastic tab out, and then on the Acara app, click the plus icon and add accessory. I'll scroll down to motion sensor and find the one I have, which is the P1. This is an older one, but it is less expensive. Then on the back of the sensor, push the button in for 5 seconds and it'll automatically be added. You can give it a name and assign it a room if you want, and you're all done. For the Amazon device, download their Alexa app and go through the setup process. Once it's added, on their Alexa app, click the plus icon and then click device. We want to give permission to tap into a car's motion sensor, so type in a car's name in the search field and find motion sensor from the drop down. It'll ask if the sensor is powered on, is it already set up in the car's app, and can you control it. It'll then scan for new devices and it actually found the motion sensor and a printer. I'll click on the one I want, you can give it a name and assign it to a room, and just like that our wireless motion sensor is now connected to a Now we need to allow a to tap into our WLED setup, but first I'm going to create some preset colors and animations. Go ahead and change the color and brightness to what you want, and then click on Presets, click the plus preset button, and give it a name. And I'm not sure if it makes a difference, but I also match the quick load label to the same as the save to ID number. Once done, you can hit save. Next, I'll change the color to blue and do another save preset as our number 2. 
Then I'll switch it to a Chase animation and change it to a greenish pink color palette and hit save as our third preset which I named Chase. And finally I'll do the last one with one of my favorite animations which is the fireworks starburst and I'll save it as our fourth preset. Then go to configure, sync interfaces, and scroll down to a voice assistant. Here you want to check the box, give the device a name, and put in the number of presets you want it to bring over. We only set up 4, but I'll enter in 9 in case I add any more later on. Then hit save to continue. After this type of change, go up to the info tab, and then at the bottom, click reboot WLED. Going back to the app, click the plus icon, and then add device. Scroll all the way down to the bottom to other, and then on the next screen, click Wi-Fi, and discover devices. Now at least for me, it did take a couple of times, but it eventually found the WLED devices plus all the presets that we saved. And this is where each preset is considered a different device that can then be controlled independently. Turn on blue. Turn on fireworks. Turn on chase. Turn on white. This last part is where we can put everything together. In the app, find the motion sensor that we set up earlier and click create routine. Under the top part where it says when, we want to add an event. Next, click smart home and then scroll down and find the motion sensor. In this screen, under when motion is, make sure it's on detected and hit next. Then add an action under Alexa will, click smart home, lights, and this is where you can choose anything in your house that's connected to Alexa, including any of the WLED presets we made earlier. I'll scroll down and find the white preset that we made and move to the next screen. I want the power to turn on, and under brightness, I want to make sure it's set to 100%, then hit next. Everything's so far looking good, so we can save it. We have our one routine set up, but I want to do one more to turn the lights off. For this, hit the plus, add an event, and find the motion sensor, but this time, keep it on not detected, and choose how long. I'll just choose one minute, and then save. For the will, choose the white light again, and under power, we want it to turn off, and hit save. So, in a nutshell, we just told that when motion is detected, we want to turn on our white light preset, and if no motion is detected for more than one minute, it can go ahead and turn the lights off. And here, as I wave my hand in front of the sensor, the lights automatically turn on to the white light preset we originally made in WLED. Now, especially with the WLED controllers being out in my garage, if your signal isn't very strong and you're having connectivity issues, I've been using this Aris modem combined with the TP-Link mesh system, and it's given us by far the best coverage we've ever had, so definitely check that out if you're running into issues. So before going over the night shots, I'll go over a couple different examples of where I tried out the sensor, and I'll do this in daylight so you can see better what's going on. For the first example, I have the motion sensor right here, and this would be a good spot if you wanted the lights to turn on when you're further away from the garage. As I drive past the motion sensor, and obviously it's harder to see during the day, but the lights do turn on. And if I ended up liking this distance, I would just build a small enclosure for the sensor to sit in and mount it on a ground stick next to the driveway. And here's that same scenario but filmed a little bit closer. Now let's say you wanted the motion sensor not so far away from the garage. Here I have it resting on one of my house lights, and as I drive up, the lights around the frame automatically turn on when I'm about 25 feet away compared to the 60 feet from the first example. Let's now fast forward to nighttime so you can see how it looks. And remember, even though I'm just doing the white color, you can set these to whatever color or animation you want, save it as a preset, and have that turn on or off when motion's detected if you wanted something different. So that about does it for this one. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoy the final results. Trying hard to fight these tears I'm crazy about you Trying hard to remember the good times I'm crazy without you Trying hard to walk away But I can't live without you Trying hard to face the truth I'm nothing without you And now I'm seeing all the same signs